I am Tara. This is my mother, Jill. We are today doing the next in our series, Penny Pension Mama, where mom raised two teenagers on $500 a month. She's the author of the book, the ebook, Penny Pension Mama and Dining on a Dime Cookbook, which you can get both in the link in the description below. And this is the next in our series. All righty. Oh, you want me to start? Go for it. <laughs> can I remember where I left off? I don't know. We left off, I think, Tara had graduated. Uh, she had gone and gotten her horticulture degree. She'd moved to Colorado at this point. My son was still living at home because he was a year younger than Tara. And so uh, she went, I, she would, she'd moved up to, let's see, I don't know where to even start. My son was still living at home, but he was going to, he, he graduated a little bit early. And then I'm just skipping through some, like the next year or two, kind of quickly. Yeah, so what happened was I came back from Sweden. Then I uh, moved out to southeastern Colorado. Yeah, I think we covered that in the last and then, one, maybe. Um, after southeastern Colorado, I moved up to northern Colorado. And for a little while, I lived in a trailer behind my mm -hmm. mom's parents' and then house. Up to Estes. Or well, Allen's I was Park. going to te technical school. And then I went up to Allen's Park, which is by Estes um, Park, Colorado. In the mountains to live. So that's where I was at this yeah. point. Yeah. And my son was still living at home because he was finishing up high school and then he started uh, getting his degree in drafting and he stayed with me. And this time period is a little bit, um, it was, it was, I hate to say calm because we had so many things happening. <laughs> I'll call it calmer than most times. Uh, he was, what we did was we moved him upstairs and I'm all for Scooshing the the adult kids out the minute they they can uh, you know they graduate and do that type of thing, but with David he was sick he was still getting his degree for drafting whether if they're still going to school that's fine he was also pulling his weight he was paying a little bit in rent you know for you rent and utilities and but he had the whole upstairs to himself and was living up there and he it had an outside entrance so he had kind of the privacy we were. It was like just the transitional space for him. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. So he was living there, and I have to tell the story because everybody will be just totally horrified, but he asked me at one point, he said, Mom, Frank doesn't have a place to stay now. Could he move upstairs with me? And I said, well, yeah, that's fine. He said, as soon as he finds another place, he'll move out. And I said, that's okay. I was living dangerously. I had two like 19, 20-something-year-old guys living in my upstairs. Do you know what that, I was waiting for the fumes from the smell to come, come, you know, come down through the ceiling towards me. So I was living, they, could, they just trashed the place. But Frank, it was the best thing that ever happened because he cleaned the place, he kept it spotless, and made David toe the line, keeping it clean. So it worked out really good. Well, but we had some, I had a couple of interesting things happen. Uh, I was sleeping one morning, one morning, all of a sudden I woke up out of this dead sleep and I looked up at the foot of my bed and here was this huge man standing. Never seen him before. He must have been six, four, six, five, muscular, big guy. Now, a normal person, what would they have done? Maybe screamed, <laughs> hollered, or done, passed out or something. No, I just looked, I'm laying in my bed and I'm looking at this guy at the foot of my bed and he very calmly looked at me and said, where's Frank? I said, go through the door this way, <laughs> upstairs and upstairs. I thought, was I insane? Yeah. And he wasn't that crazy. So I learned to get nerves of steel. I have a thing on my refrigerator that says, you can't scare me, I have children. And you know, I thought that was the perfect magnet to put on my refrigerator. But... He was a friend of Frank's that was coming, I found out later, that was coming to pick him up for work, you know, and he just had gotten in the wrong door somehow or another and ended up in my bedroom. But, I mean, I would have little things. I don't know if that's a little thing. For me, it was a little thing happened like that throughout. But, so we eventually, so I would just, it was just something still constantly, but it wasn't near as traumatizing as the past few years had been. It had settled down, you know, pretty much. My son uh, met his wife, and they ended up getting married. And I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of jumping over big chunks. So was that bit. before the guy?
guy that got locked in your basement? That was after the guy got locked in my basement. Oh, so we've you already talk? done that. We've already done that one. You on talking another, about the yeah, guy getting locked? Yeah, we're oh, talking okay. about the guy getting locked. Okay. Yeah, I had a guy get locked in my basement um, a while before yeah. that, okay. and so this was after the guy getting locked in my basement all night in my basement. But anyway, it's only been six months since we did the last show. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, it's gonna be hard <laughs> for me to remember and keep things on track. But anyway, they met each other and they got married. And, um, of course, lots of things happen, but uh, we're trying to, you know, finish this up a little bit so you won't get too bored with it. But um, they got married, and Tar and Mike met then, and they got married. And at their wedding, it was, I loved their, their wedding turned out. I won't, Tar has talked about that before, so I won't go into details about their wedding. But the day... I was supposed to, I was up in Estes for the wedding, and my son and his wife were there for the wedding because they were part of it. And Tar and Mike were going on their honeymoon, and they said that I could stay, they, well, they asked me to stay and watch their apartment. Well, it was Tar's apartment, but I guess it was both of yours at this point, and watch the dog. And I was in Estes Park, Colorado. I mean, for those of you that don't know that are in other countries, it's just like it's in the mountains, it's just beautiful. And they asked me to stay in their apartment and watch things for two weeks while they were gone. And it's not like Estes that a lot of people see. The tourists were all gone. They were married in October and the place had become a ghost town. And I thought I died and went to heaven. The weather was perfect. I mean, it was quiet and peaceful. And my daughter-in-law and son, before they left to come back to Kansas, my daughter-in-law at this point was expecting with my first grandbaby. And she said, she said, don't stay. She said, come back home with us and don't stay. And I said, you've got a month and a half before the baby comes. I'll be back in plenty of time. Don't worry about it. You know, you got, you got lots. She said, no. She said, what if it comes early? What if something happens? I said, it'll be fine. So they headed on home. And I'm at this point staying in Tar, at Tar and Mike's uh, in their their apartment, enjoying every moment. And I'd been there for about a week, at, and I decided it was Sunday, so I thought, well, I'm going to drive on down the mountain and go to my folks. It was about an, what, an hour and a half to grandma, an hour. hour to grandma's. And I would drive down the mountain and go to church with my folks that morning, and we'd go out to eat and spend the day with them because I hadn't seen them since the wedding. So i get down the mountain. We were gone all day till about... I think it was three or four in the afternoon. We arrive home, and on and that was before cell phones. Mm -hmm. Remember, this was before cell phones, and we get into their house, and on my folks's answering machine was like fifteen, twenty messages from my son. Totally frantic. She's gone into labor. She's having contractions. What do we do? What do we do? And then the next one. Well, the contractions have stopped. Do we wait? What should we do? Then oh, dude, oh, they started again. They started again. What should we do? What should we do? And what was so funny about him is my son is like he's like was like his dad, so calm, isn't he? Cool, you know. He doesn't get in a flap over anything. He knows how to figure out stuff. And uh, if there's a bad situation. He can calmly figure out what do we need to do for this. And here he was frantic, just totally frantic. And I was just laughing. I mean, he, it was a little concerning that my daughter-in-law was in labor, but it was so funny as I looked on it later about how frantic. And then I went back to Tars, and there was as many messages on her machine at her apartment. So I, I, was, I was kind of frantic at this point. I'm thinking, okay, should I head out right away to Colorado? But I had to drive back up the mountain, close up their apartment because it was for a week because it had to be closed for a week, figure out what to do with their dog, get all my stuff packed up, you know, and grab my dog, James, was with me, and drive back down the mountain. By the time I got back down to Grandma's, I'd already driven four hours that day, up and down the mountain, up to church, and back and forth. And so... I, I still had the chronic fatigue, and I had it really, really bad. And so it was about 6 in the afternoon, and I thought, do I take off? You know, I was so excited. I want. I told Shayla I'd be there for her. I didn't know what to do, but 
I was pretty exhausted at this point and I didn't, I was afraid I was going to miss what was happening with Shayla and the baby because I wouldn't have any way to call or talk to him on the driving. And so I decided to wait because I was so tired. I should have went though because I, we were up all night and because my son would call about every 30 minutes or an hour to tell me what was happening. I have got to give if there's any son-in-laws or sons listening, I'm sure there's not, but I have got to give my son and son-in-law credit. Whenever I wasn't there for the babies at the hospital when the babies were born, they were so good that they would call me all the time that you were in labor or my daughter-in-law. And it was hard for them to do that at that time because you didn't have cell phones. They had to make a special point of finding a phone and then using like a calling card or something mm -hmm. to try to get a hold of me. So I really appreciated the fact that they did that. So we were up all night long and finally it was about four, five in the morning and my grandson was born. Ah, oh, they're so cute. I love those grandbabies. I love them. They're just a Adorable. There's BJ standing in the background, so I'm having to go on. <laughs> what was so funny about the grandbabies being born, I was so excited when my first one, Cody, was born that I thought, well, you know, this will be the ultimate. But then BJ came along, and I was just as excited with him. And on down to the very last one with Jack, it was like, these are the coolest things that ever happened to me and they're each one just as exciting. Oh no, my kids say they're not having fun. <laughs> I mean, I was just flipping out excited. I was so excited. You know, I mean, it was just beyond anything. But anyway, so I got about three, four hours sleep and then I took off for, for Kansas uh, to get back there and to see my, my, grand, my grandson for the first time. It was kind of funny because poor James, what I had to do was the highway I took to go home, I had to drive. James was with me, the dog, my dog, and I couldn't leave him in the car. I had to take him all the way home, drop him off, and then drive 30 minutes back again to the hospital to see my grandson, which I was so impatient to get up there. So poor James, I screeched into our driveway, picked him up out of the car, set him down, and I said, go potty now. And he looked at me like, all right, I'll hurry as fast as I can, you know. I mean, give a guy a break here. Give me at least two seconds to touch the ground first. And he went potty, and I threw him in the door of the house, shut the door, and took off driving again. I, that poor dog was probably so confused what I was doing to him. But anyway, I got up there to see my first grandbaby. So that was one of the exciting things that happened to me. Then I went, and it was, I didn't have, it was what I call a wilderness period time. And what happens, I never realized that what they were for a long, long time. I was so used to having very, lots of crises, you know, very dramatic stuff happening constantly that when I had this lull, it kind of, I wasn't quite sure how to deal with it. But I finally at this point learned that when a wilderness time happened, it was a time for God to either give me a break and rest, like, you know, in, it was Elijah or Elijah under the juniper tree, and the angel fed him food and told him, God said, to rest and sent the angel to feed him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need those times, you know, like that, because it builds up our strength because maybe God knows we're going to be going into something else, or just, you know, that we need the rest at that moment. And this was, this whole time period was kind of like that, because I had, uh, Cody was born, I did have surgery, some very, very major surgery, and uh, that helped me a lot because I went, after the surgery, I could do nothing for six months, and I had to just rest, and I kept trying to go still. You know how we do, Tara and I still to this day, we keep going and going, but I was forced to stay down for six months, and I had a really dear friend, she was my neighbor too. She sent me a plate of food every evening uh, with one of her kids. She filled up this plate. The kids ran the food up to my house every night. And I never dreamed that that one thing would make such a big difference mm -hmm. in my life. And I've mentioned this before, so you know it must have been important to me. Well, it was just 
at that point, I, I didn't have the strength to even fix me anything, let alone try to decide what to eat. And I really got to feeling better with my chronic fatigue. And I was doing much, much better. And I gained my strength back at this point. And uh, the kids were living upstairs. Uh, when, they, when my son and daughter-in-law got married, they moved in upstairs because she was finishing school at this point. I was kind of watching my grandson for about four hours in the morning and uh, taking care of him. And it was real handy having them live upstairs. Of course, they were paying me rent for their little apartment up there. And they weren't up there, but, oh, I don't know, maybe five months they were up there, six at the top. So she got her school done. And I wanted to stop and say this here. Both Tara and David, I've always appreciated, ever since they've had kids and my grandkids have been born, they never, I don't know how to say this, took advantage of me for being the grandma. We weren't mooching off of you. <laughs> I was trying to be kind of tactful here. Oh, sorry, tact's not my You know. Suit. Because it would have been easy for my son and his wife to ask, well, will you watch the baby all the time? We're, we don't, they didn't have, and they didn't have two beans to rub together. No money. And Tara and Mike were in the same position too when their kids were born. But they didn't say, you know, we have to have the income. You've got to watch the baby so she can go to work and this. What they did was after she got out of school, uh, she... She worked one shift, and he worked the other shift. They sacrificed their own comfort and wants so that they did and didn't make me sacrifice mine. You see what I'm, does that make sense, what well, I'm saying? People think it's a right nowadays that, oh, well, daycare is expensive, so grandma's going to watch the baby so I can go to work and have the brand new car. Yeah, yeah. Or a nice house. Yeah, or, or anything I want like that to give them more of a comfortable life. They want the mom and dad to sacrifice mm -hmm. and take care of the kids. There are situations. Now, please, don't eat, make comments. You know, we if, get it. if yeah. my when my daughter was sick, when the grandkids were sick, I was all over them taking care of them. That's a different situation. There are... There are no, crisis a, a situations, yes, illness, a, a yeah. spouse dies, there are situations like that. But for a couple to say, we need two incomes just because we want to have things nicer and more comfortable for us, so grandma, babysit the kids for us. Give up your life, your time of comfort, and start watching kids all over again. And so don't do that if you're younger. Your grandparents need to say no. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's part of it. I think the kids knew that I had always said, even before the grandkids came along, I would be all over those grandkids. And I watched them a lot. When Tara was sick, when we were in Idaho, Michael was in Washington working all during the week. Ellie was deathly sick. I, I was just constantly over there. It worked out really good because I lived across the street helping her and helping her. But it was a different situation. It wasn't that she was wanting to go to work to get more money. To buy the new car. To buy the new car. So, you know, yeah, you just need to take control of your lives. Each of you need to take control of your lives. So parents do and the grandparents. Don't let the kids live with you forever and forever and make excuses, you know. Even, even if your child says, well, um, uh, my husband's left me. I would never have stayed at my folks more than three to six months till I, you know, mm -hmm. I would just have a short time period. You don't plan it for a year, two yeah. years, three years, or something like that. So um, anyway, I really appreciated that fact in my kid, in that my kids didn't do do that and take advantage. So they were living upstairs, but eventually they moved out into their own place, and then uh, Tar and Mike. In the meantime, they moved down to Texas, <laughs> and how long did you last in Texas? Six Not very long, six months. I thought it was only about six months. It was a six-month lease, and <laughs> after the second week, I was like, we're out of here on the six-month lease. <laughs> sorry, all you so, Texans, I'm sorry. I know, it was the heat was just too much for it, and so they had decided to move, and what they did was we had an ugly old green pickup, They've mentioned this before, but I'll just touch it real quickly. And I think it was January. Mm -hmm. 
Was it around Christmas? Did you come back for Christmas first or just in January? No, because our in... lease was up on the 31st. So we okay. stayed. I and didn't then we think came you were there. January yeah. 1st. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it was the first week of January. They took the old green pickup and it had four foot wooden sides that they stuck on the pickup. So it was heaped over the cab. These They piled it with, full of all their stuff. Had that old, I mean, it was like Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, it yeah. shook when they drove it. Filled up Tar's uh, car with, um, as packed it as full. The poor dog, they put their bed, her, packed the front seat with Tar, put the dog's bed, and I think he had just enough to sit up, didn't he, on his dog bed to ride with her in the front seat. And so they drove in the and first. They had a cab. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. In there, too. <laughs> and so they uh, drove drove down to my place because they were going to spend about a week or so there. We were in Texas, uh -huh. so we drove up to Mom in Kansas. In Kansas. On our way to Idaho. On their way to Idaho, and they were going to spend the week. And so the day before they left, they said a blizzard was coming, a really bad blizzard, that I-70, which was the main road all the way across Kansas that they had to drive, was going to even be closed. Mm -hmm. The blizzard, this was, we found out the day before they were supposed to leave. I always find it interesting how things work out. You get stalled for reasons at an airport that you can't make it out. Never get impatient or angry if your plans don't go all the way through. Sometimes there's a reason for it. Okay, are, are we going to make it through this? I don't know if you know what part I'm going to talk about now. This part is going to be very, very hard. I think I can make it through it, but it's going to be hard. So they... They got stranded. They couldn't go on. They had to stay at my house one more night, at least one more night. And um, that night, the blizzard had already started. And we're talking, we're not talking a heavy snow. We're talking, if you've ever seen a little house on the prairie, and Pa ties a rope to the, the post of the house, and he's trying to make it out to the barn, and he has to hold on to the rope because he can't see to make it back to the mm -hmm. house. This is the type of blizzard we're talking. It just total white out. Kansas does not have snow that falls straight. No. Kansas has snow that blows sideways. sideways. <laughs> Thick, deep, yeah. and drifting, drifting, drifting snow, and lots of it. And it was bitter, bitter cold, just ice pellets and bitter cold. Well, that night, the one they were supposed to have left in the morning, that night I had to take James, you know, and if you've been with us at any time, amount of time, you know James was this dog that was just like, oh my goodness, he was beyond special. He, I'd had lots of dogs before, but this dog was really different. Everybody that ran, came, manned him, seemed to get attacked. Michael laughed at us when we first told him about talking to the dog and stuff like this. He, he laughed at us, oh, it's just a dog, you know, it's just a dog. Even Michael fell in love with James, you know, and to this day, he'll even talk about some, you know, something about James and stuff. Everybody loved this silly dog. So I took him out. He was getting older, getting much older at this point, and I had to carry him outside because it was steps, and it was icy, and he had arthritis. So I lifted and carried him out. Of course, it's snowing and cold. He had his socks on his feet so he wouldn't get cold. And he wouldn't go to the bathroom. And I'm standing there in the freezing cold, and he just wouldn't go. Well, sometimes dogs don't like being out in the cold any more than we do, let alone to try to go to the bathroom, you know, in the middle of all this. So I lifted it up, him up and carried him back in. I said, well, just wake me up in the night. We wake up the next morning, and, um, and I took him out again, and he didn't go to the bathroom. I knew right away that something was wrong. Something was really wrong. And it's still a blizzard outside, like you can't imagine. And I carry him back in, and I told the kids, I said, we've got to get him to the vet. And I called the vet because it was so bad, we didn't even know if the vet was going yeah. to be open. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, they were open. So you've got to envision this. Tara's car, I'd taken my car and lent it to my son the day before because their car was so lightweight it wouldn't go in the snow. So he had my car to get them, try to make them to work, get them to work. And then, I, cause I, so I lent the car to my son because their car was real lightweight, low to the ground, and they needed to go to work 
during the blizzard maybe, and I didn't need to go any place, so I'd let them borrow my car. So all we had was Tara's car, which was packed to the hilt. It was parked outside, covered in snow, in the blizzard. We had to unload all tons of stuff out of her car in this blizzard and carried it into the house, getting wet with snow, and, try, and we're trying to hurry because we wanted to hurry and get James to the vet, you know, because we thought it, this might be serious, and we were trying to hurry. So Michael, Michael ended up going, didn't he? Didn't no, it was just you and me because I was in the back seat with yeah. James. And Tara jumped in the front, and so we, um, I sat in the back with James, and we, I don't know how you drew th drove through that blizzard, but we actually made it to the vet. And we got him there, and the vet checked him over, and, and, um, I'm sorry. He said we had to put him to sleep. Sorry, guys. It was really hard on us. You can tell. <laughs> I've got to get Kleenex. And, um, and, uh, and so we told him oh, to do it. And so Tar and I were in there with him, and the worst thing I felt bad was. I called David, and we didn't wait long enough for David to get there in the snow, and he didn't get to say goodbye to him. I felt really bad about that, but, but we held him while we put him to sleep. And you know what? If you've got a pet that you've had for a long time, that pet has loved you unconditionally. The vet said we could leave the room. Don't you leave him there. They're scared. I didn't want his last, last moments to be by himself and scared. And it tore me apart. And Tara, to have to be there. But I didn't want to give up my comfort and lack of hurt for him who had been so faithful to us and loved us so much. So you stay there with him and you hold him. We took him home. We, <laughs> well, we wanted to bury him at home. So we wrapped him up and took him home. And I don't know how you drove. Tara was crying. We were driving through the storm, trying to get home. And I mean, we're talking wind chills minus 15, and my son went outside, and he, we were going to bury him in the backyard. And my son has asthma, and when cold air gets into him, it just, oh, it's just horrendous for him. And he and Mike were out there digging James's grave, and they were chiseling <laughs> James's grave. Oh, it was a nightmare. It was January in Kansas. The, the ground was like a rock. It was it really totally was frozen. Frozen. And, um, oh, my makeup's going to get all messed up. <laughs> and so David was trying so hard to dig that grave. And, of course, he couldn't breathe. And Michael said he was standing there, and he said, I kept saying, David, let me, let me take over. And, of course, David was upset. And, and Michael kept saying, and couldn't breathe. And Michael, he, Michael was afraid David was going to collapse on him. And he said, let me take over and dig. And David kept digging. He said, oh, this is what breaks my heart. David said, this is the last thing I can do for him. And so he, he said, I've got to do this for him. I know you pet lovers out there. Or those of you that aren't pet lovers don't understand this. Those of you that have pets will understand, but um, it totally broke my heart. Completely, something happened. I had lost pets before, but there was something about James that it was like the rug had been pulled out from under us. And I lost it. 
I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Does anybody have those little ones? Is that real <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we have them on a daily oh. basis now. And I something snapped in me, and I um, I lost it. I just I don't know what happened. Do you remember how bad I was at that time? I couldn't. I just sat in the chair. I wouldn't wash my hands for a day or two. I don't think. I I couldn't move. I just sat there just crying uncontrollably. I think it was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. It would just lit up to a whole, whole bunch of stuff. But Tar and Mike went down. I think you went to Walmart. I don't know how you went in the blizzard. And they left for and came back. And Tara bought me a little frame, and she had a picture of James that she put put in there for me, and she gave me this little frame. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, a picture of James, and she put the purple ribbon on there because James's favorite color was purple. He loved purple. He would sing. I'm dreaming of a purple Christmas. It was never a white Christmas. It was always a purple Christmas. And so she put that on there, and I held onto that silly frame, and I wouldn't let go of it. And that was probably the biggest comfort to me of anything. And it was, it was really hard, and you guys had to go ahead and leave, didn't you? You left, was it the next day or the day after that? I think it was the next day. I think you went right away. They had to leave then. Poor no, Tara. No, it was the day after that. Poor Tara. She, she. I, I don't know what. I don't know how she made the trip because she was just as upset just about as what I was. And um, I, w I have never grieved like that. And you know, be patient with people. This was just our dog. I just can't even fathom if you lose a child or a parent. People that grieve, it just, something happens, and you've got to be understanding and compassionate. I know it was just a few, I don't know how, why this happened this way, but a few days after Tar and Mike left, my husband had been living in Ohio. To, you know, we'd been divorced at this point, but for some reason he came back to Wichita, and it was still snowing horribly, and I remember... He was standing there, and I was still crying and crying. And he was standing there, uh, hugging me, trying to comfort me. And I was looking out the window, looking at James's grave, and it was just snow was piling up. And I, I kept crying. I said, "He's going to be so cold." He was always sleeping on the electric blanket. He was such a he uh, spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> he was very special. He needed his electric blanket. Spoiled. <laughs> and and I was crying that he was going to be cold out there, and I couldn't get control of myself. And my husband said, it's okay. He said, I'm going to take a blanket out, and I'll cover him up for you. And he did. He did that for me. He didn't, he didn't act like I was bonkers, which I was. He didn't think I was crazy or anything. He, um, he just very calmly said, let me go put the blanket on him. And it calmed me down. It calmed me down. And so it was so hard. So hard. Well, then Tor and Mike had left, and they were heading on to Idaho. I just continued. So on. we're headed off to Idaho, and we're going to wait and let you hear the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry so. to leave the cliffhanger, guys. We so we're going to leave the cliffhanger because our trip to Idaho was... Interesting. Yeah, say the least. It's a miracle we even made it out there. So. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Okay, we'll see you guys next time. Please visit us at livingoutadime.com. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.